So this afternoon, uh, we are uh, really lucky to have uh, two speakers who are going to share their wealth of knowledge um, uh, and insights um, in the advances of pain and pain management. Our first uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Pavan uh, Tonka. Uh, he is a uh, a pain uh, specialist uh, here at the Cleveland Clinic. He directs our comprehensive uh, pain recovery um, a unit in the Neurologic Institute. Uh, he has uh, not been a stranger to the Cleveland Clinic as he did his uh, training here in a fellowship in pain medicine where he was also the chief fellow. Um, he left for a little while but then saw the light and he's back um, with us um, uh, as the medical director. And I have to say, all the meetings that I ever have with him, he is the most zen-like person. Like, no matter where I'm running from, when I, when I sit down and we have these meetings, he's, he always uh, uh, kind of resets my, my tone and my mood. So he is really um, a, a special physician who has a really great touch in this area. Um, so welcome. Uh, and uh, he's going to talk to us about pain recovery, the Cleveland uh, Clinic experience. Dr. Tonka, thank you. Thank you for the, uh, the very kind introduction. Can everyone hear me? All right. Fantastic. Um, as an anesthesiologist, uh, when I was practicing anesthesiology, I only had 30 seconds to a minute to build rapport with patients before we took them in for life-changing surgery. And so I thought I'd do something similar here uh, to everyone and just want to let you know, I happily see patients with fibromyalgia. So now that we're all best friends, I want to run three, uh, three things to think about. And I'm going to come back to this at the end. Say you have a young patient who's working full time who has an acute pain process. Keep that one patient in mind. Your second patient is a patient who's had pain for 30, 40 years on disability. The, the pain has completely ruined their life. That's patient two. Patient three is a patient who has an incurable and untreatable disease. So just think about how you would approach treatments for those three patients. And we'll, we'll get back to this at the end. Do, uh, I have one disclosure. My daughter is cute. Um, you will find her in multiple talks I give. Um, if in case you're wondering what I do when I'm not at work, uh, she's the new center of my universe. Uh, so let's talk about pain um, from a very basic, basic level. The IASP definition, I would argue, is one of the best I, I've seen holds holds true. It's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. Sensory and emotional experience. And so <laughs> I apologize. This will bring back a lot of bad memories of uh, medical school for a lot of people here, uh, basic physiology. Um, but uh, I trained as a pharmacologist. I, I studied it in undergrad. I studied in grad school. So yes, I'm a complete nerd. Um, but one of the things we talked about in pharmacology is you have to understand the biological pathways. And what we do as pharmacologists is we just draw an X from one pathway to the next. And so when we talk about pain, I think it's very important to understand what the pathways are. And so those pathways, transduction, transmission, perception, and modulation. Uh, briefly, so medicine is not my first career. It's not my second career. It's actually like my eighth career. And in one of my previous lives, I was a, a cancer researcher uh, very, very shortly. And one of the directors at the center I uh, would always take the new recruits and say, hey, who th here thinks we're going to cure cancer? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah we're going to cure cancer. And he's like, well, you know, we, we can all agree it's a genetic disease, minimum of eight to ten genetic mutations. Um, can we cure sickle cell with one genetic mutation? And like, no. he's like, well, how are we going to cure cancer? And I was like, oh, perspective. And so I, I, I use that perspective with pain as well. People are like, you know, what's that thing to help with pain? When we think about transduction, we're talking about a minimum a minimum of a dozen different um, uh, enzymes that are released intracellularly or elsewhere. Transmission uh, at the level of the dorsal horn. You have the incoming efferent signals, efferent signals, the interneurons, the glial cells, descending modulation. Uh, with perception, we still don't understand the actual neural circuitry that's responsible for perception. Modulation, I would uh, argue, we understand fairly well, but it's a very, very complex system. So to look for that one thing I would argue is not realistic. So now if we overlap the definition of pain with the pain pathways, what we see here is again sensory and emotional. 
or another way of thinking about it, you have your transmission transduction modulation, and then you have the perception. Thought experiment. I do apologize. I know it's the afternoon. You've had lunch. You don't want to think, right? Who, got, who went into medicine to think, right? We have a couple of thought experiments. Here's the first one. You have a patient with cancer, any cancer. Thankfully for them, uh, the cancer is amenable to surgery, chemo, and radiation. Best, uh, best options available. Now, how many of us would only offer the patient one treatment? Sir, ma'am, we're just going to go with radiation and see what happens. Right? That, that's absurd. Who would possibly do that? Well, fun fact, that's basically what we do with pain management. We offer medications, injections, surgery. Let's just see what happens. Let's just see what happens. All the while ignoring the perception aspect of pain. Uh, and so just to also make the point, um, how many of you, again, most of us see patients with pain, how many of you actively ask if the patient's feeling sad, if they're feeling depressed, if they're anxious, if the pain causes issues with relationships, financial problems? More often than not, that's not asked. Or if it is, um, it's not subsequently addressed. So what, how do we approach this? What do we do? Yay, my department. 44 years ago, before there were good biomedical treatments, the people who started comprehensive pain recovery at Cleveland Clinic realized, hey, we can address the psychosocial aspects of chronic pain. And so what do we address? We address mood, function, sleep. Uh, essentially, we address the suffering associated with pain. Sorry, one more. I promise it's the last. So think about your training. Again, uh, we could go back to medical school, residency, fellowship. You recall learning about heart disease. I remember in med school, a, a six-week block learning about heart disease. Cancer. Uh, again, Robin's Pathological Basis of Disease. Great chapter. We had to read it multiple times. Diabetes. I remember learning this uh, in clinic, seeing it um, clinically. But how about chronic pain? Does anyone remember officially learning about chronic pain in any of our training? No. Yet, when you look at chronic pain, there are more patients with chronic pain than diabetes, heart disease, and cancer combined. Uh, so, in essence, what I argue is when we're treating pain, we're essentially winging it. We don't have any official training, uh, and we're just seeing what happens. And if you use that mindset with any of these other diseases, we'd probably lose our license, right? Oh, let me just see what happens. Let me try to treat your cancer, see what happens. Oh, it didn't work? My bad. It happens a lot when we talk about chronic pain. We see it a lot uh, here as well. All right. So what do we do? How do we approach pain? What, what are we teaching medical students? What are we trying to do? Pain through the biopsychosocial model. Three components, obviously, the biological, the psychological, and social. And I'll briefly uh, go over those for everyone. So the biological, what, what does our department do? Comprehensive pain recovery. Uh, I'm a pain management physician by training. So when I see patients, I make sure all reasonable and conventional pain options have been tried. So that's the medication injection surgery. Uh, I also work with an addiction psychiatrist. Unfortunately, we're all well aware of the problems with uh, the opioid epidemic, issues with heroin, fentanyl, various semi-synthetic versions of fentanyl finding their way into medications. Um, so our addiction psychiatrist is very helpful. We wean opioids, benzos, and cannabinoids. This is not new. We've been doing this for about, uh, say, 20 years now. Um, well before, again, opioids prescribing were a thing, we realized uh, very early on that, you know, we're not getting the effects. So when patients come to us, one of the first things we discuss is, hey, you have to come off these medications. A common, <laughs> common conversation you may have had with patients is, oh, well, it's working. I ask patients, if it's working, what are you doing sitting here across from me, right? You should be working full time. You should have your quality of life. Oftentimes, that's not the case. So let's try coming off this medication and see, see what happens. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, wellness, diet, nutrition, activity, sleep, all three of those things uh, interact with another, uh, one another. All three of those things also directly relate how we feel pain. Uh, and finally, uh, ketamine infusions, something I do here. Um, there, there's not 
the greatest evidence. We, we don't know how ketamine works for pain. Um, briefly, it's an NMDA receptor antagonist. For the longest time, as an anesthesiologist, I would tell patients, oh, it binds NMDA receptors in the spinal cord. That's how it helps pain. When I started reading up about it, there are NMDA receptors at a dozen different places in the CNS. I don't know how ketamine's working. Um, it, it's very, very complex. Roughly, though, it helps about 30% of patients with chronic pain, but we have no idea how. So that's what we uh, in my department deal with in terms of the biological. In terms of the psychosocial, oops. Sorry, I messed up the slide. So it's, a, it's three pieces. It's maladaptive thoughts. Here we go. Psychosocial, uh, psychological distress and maladaptive behaviors. These are three things that keep patients in chronic pain. The best example of the maladaptive thought is the patient you see in the office. You ask them about their pain. They're crying. You know, this is the worst pain ever. My, my life is over. You spend the time. You speak with them. You, you talk through everything. They leave the office. Thank you so much, doctor. I feel so much better. You see your next patient, someone from the front desk said, hey, the, the patient's calling, crying. They're in horrible pain. You have to do something now. You're thinking, I spent an hour speaking to him. What's going on? One of the maladaptive thought processes is catastrophization. Um, it is a process patients do not have control over, and it's a uh, magnification of pain symptoms and anxiety. Uh, that is something that is very common with chronic pain patients. Psychological distress. One in 10 of people have depression in the general population. It's almost triple or quadruple with patients with chronic pain. Same thing with anxiety. General population is about 19%. Chronic pain patients, 35%. A lot of them have both. Uh, this also does not include uh, post-traumatic stress, bipolar, OCD, and ADHD, which can also uh, cause worsening of pain. And that psychological distress causes maladaptive behaviors. No longer working, no longer helping around the house, no longer doing what they enjoy, which subsequently leads to maladaptive thoughts. It's a cycle. And so the thought process is, if this is a three-legged stool. If we could just knock one of the legs off, we'd be in business. And so that's what our department um, does. What we can do with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is address all three of these domains. There are more intensive emotion-based therapies that we can also offer um, to try to get patients um, some of the control back from the pain. And as I mentioned, all three areas maintain disability. So what, what does my department do? What, what are the outcomes? You know, we've been around for a while. Essentially, what we've shown over decades, we can improve pain, decrease disability, which, uh, interestingly enough, if patients are on opioids, high dose benzos, or cannabinoids, simply weaning them can also get you similar results. Uh, and again, this is when compared to medications or physical therapy, improve mood and function. Uh, there was recently a meta-analysis uh, that also showed that um, the, the programs, pain recovery programs, can uh, do all these things. And again, if you look at the HHS best practice guidelines, 2019, um, pain recovery options are in there as well. People often wonder, you know, who do we, who do we send your way? This sounds interesting. I'm thinking of a patient want to send over in a couple different ways. Uh, historically, we would say try everything, then send them to us. Uh, we've inverted that model. Send any patient with pain as early as you want. Again, as a pain management physician, I can talk about uh, anything from an acute stage all the way to chronically. Um, so earlier is better. Or again, if a patient talks about fear of movement, suffering, again, the, the crime, you know what the pain does to them, but you don't know where the pain is a couple minutes into the, uh, the visit, isolation, loss of function. Or again, as I mentioned, the catastrophizing, um, if you see this after multiple visits, or just very simply, very simply, one question. Is the pain causing you suffering? That's all you have to ask. If the patient says yes, send them over to our department. We'll be happy to evaluate to see how we can address that suffering. So again, uh, here are the pathways. Here is the overlay. Uh, and so just briefly, oops. Here's my cute daughter again. Um, briefly, I want to come back to those three scenarios I mentioned to sort of have you tuck away. Young patient working full time with an acute pain issue, patient with pain for multiple decades, uh, and then finally that patient who has an incurable, untreatable condition. How do we, how do we approach that? Do we offer every patient the same options? Sometimes that's what occurs. Uh, my argument uh, with the treatment of chronic pain is we need to find the right patient at the right time for the right treatment. 
So again, my intensive program doesn't make sense for that patient who's working full time who has an acute pain problem, but may make more sense for the patient who has a chronic condition. For the patient who's had a chronic condition, again, telling them, hey, here's some ibuprofen, you need to lose some weight, probably not the best treatment options for that patient at that time. Finally, the patient who has a, an incurable, untreatable condition, which we see all too often in the Neurologic Institute, what do we do then? What can my department help with? We help with empowerment and hope. So there's something we can offer every patient every time. It just has to be individualized. And so uh, that's that's what we do. And just so cute. I mean, I could just have 10 slides of this, right? You guys would be like, greatest talk ever. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, and I think if there are any questions later, happy to answer them. Okay, so we, we've saved this session to the end uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I, I think we're off to a, a really great start, and uh, I am very privileged um, to uh, introduce uh, our, our really keynote speaker, even though we're at the end of our, 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 our session. Uh, Dr. Haider Warek is an academic cardiologist from Boston. I view him as a, a Janus-like figure with two, two, two heads and two faces. He's, he's a card-carrying academic. He's an assistant professor at Harvard, associate director of some big cardiology thing at uh, the Boston VA, um, has a formidable CV with numerous academic articles in high-powered journals. But I first became... Um, introduced to him um, last year sometime in, in 2022 when uh, during the course of reading one of these daily uh, uh, nature medicine kind of shout outs you get that tells you all the news that's going on in science um, uh, they had a, a, a the books of the of the week or the or the month and and I something caught my eye uh, so there's a book on chronic pain uh, that uh, got a few sentences of a very nice review. I said, that sounds kind of interesting to me. So I got the book immediately. And, uh, you know, I opened up the cover and I said, like, what's this guy doing? He's a cardiologist. I'm like, mm, you should tell me about chronic pain. And um, it's a very powerful book. Uh, he'll, he'll speak for it uh, in himself. I just reviewed it in Helio Rheumatology um, um, this uh, past uh, month. And um, uh, I, I have I've read it several times, and it's uh, heavily copied and underlined. And um, it is in the spirit of what uh, Pavan has just uh, talked about. It is really the story of pain, and I, he will get into this. But uh, 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 Dr. Warek is a, a, a gifted writer. Um, his uh, pieces have appeared in. Uh, the New York Times and the Atlantic and um, multiple uh, major feeds. Um, uh, he has spoken at grand rounds at every major institution uh, that I could think of, uh, just looking at where he's been traveling. Uh, but his uh, interpretation of pain, which is in the in the in the spirit of what we just started uh, hearing, um, is a refreshing and a clarion call for a change and how we view this. And if you think about what we've heard in this meeting, we talked about a lot of immunology, but we keep coming back to suffering. And we're all uh, practitioners and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Len, for the kind introduction. Uh, I was just telling uh, Len that I grew up in Pakistan. I was a medical student there and uh, my parents didn't have a lot of uh, money, so we didn't get to travel much. So the first time I ever left Pakistan uh, was when I was a final year medical student going for an uh, elective rotation. Uh, and so the very first city I saw outside of Pakistan was Cleveland, Ohio. And the first hospital I saw outside of Pakistan was a Cleveland clinic. I assumed that every American hospital is going to be like this. Uh, obviously, all of you know that's not the case. So it's a real privilege to be back here, uh, to, be talk to be able to talk about something that I am uh, very, very passionate about. 
And uh, I think the, what you asked is a very, very valid question. Uh, I often ask that of myself, is why is a cardiologist talking about pain? And the reason I'm talking about pain today is because pain has been part of my life longer or even before I was a uh, fully trained uh, physician. I, you know, like many other people, pain, uh, I'd had my brushes with pain, you know, the usual injuries, uh, you know, getting your hand stuck in the door, et cetera, but nothing, nothing beyond that until um, I was in my third year of medical school and uh, I was uh, in the gym and something sort of uh, went awry in my back. I was taken to the emergency room. I had very severe back pain. I got some uh, I got some pictorial act and I was told that your pain's gonna get better tomorrow and I believed it because that had been my relationship with pain. And yet that wasn't what really happened. Pain became a part of my life uh, and became a persistent part of my life, really controlling every aspect of what it was like to be me uh, for months and years. Um, and even though I've gotten uh, better since then, I, I realized over time that, is that the story of pain is much bigger than myself. Uh, and it affects so many people, and it remains, to, in my view, uh, one of the least understood biological and social phenomena that we experience as individuals and as a society. And that really led me to write the book uh, called The Song of Our Scars, The Untold Story of Pain. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a sort of uh, really share that journey that I took as I was writing this book. I'm going to read some parts of the book, and as I read parts of the book, I'm going to share some pictures of people I took back when I was in medical school. Uh, you know, I took a photography as a way of distracting myself from what was going on inside me, and yet now that I look back, everywhere I pointed the camera, I saw pain. Pain is a fundamental truth. Pain might well be the first sensation a baby feels as it's born a gateway to the world of conscious experience, almost certainly becoming the sensation it most strongly associates with being alive. And indeed, every subsequent day of our lives, we experience pains of different types. These are often innocuous, but can at times become intractable. Yet pain is also the most fluid of all sensations. Pain has transformed from a spiritual force, often the only language through which celestial agents could speak to mortal beings, into a corporeal corruption that can be entirely comprehended and conquered with biomedical advances. Yet other aspects of the place of pain in our society have remained unchanged. Pain in how it is recognized, treated, and inflicted has always been and remains an instrument of power, often used against the weak. For it is impossible to separate the assessment of pain from the assignment of supremacy. Pain is imperialistic. European colonists often derided the pain of their black and brown subjects, chalking it up to feebleness. Pain is racial. Black slaves were often subjected to indescribable violence under the false pretext that they were too numb to feel the pain. Pain is gendered. Women are more likely to feel pain, but their pain is also more likely to be dismissed. And most of all, pain is personal so personal that it is said to be the one thing truly our own. In the last two centuries, our understanding of how our bodies flourish and falter has advanced tremendously. And yet even as the song of our scars reaches a deafening pitch, pain remains a sensation we comprehend the least. It is not an accident that we fail to understand the very basics of pain. The attempt to define pain beginning in the 19th century using clinical and scientific terms shrank its scope to fit the constraints of the tools and rituals of medicine. And yet, as we recognize the broad extent of this extraordinary tragedy, we have to consider something even more elemental, that almost everything we know about pain and how we treat it is wrong. To understand pain is to know the human body and the human mind and how they're interweaved. To understand pain is to recognize how race, gender, ethnicity, and power come to mark what it means to inhabit the human frame. To understand pain is to learn how the greatest medical tragedy in history came to be. Yet the need to understand pain is not just a scientific curiosity for me. It has allowed me to find a new way to live in my body. Broadening the lens through which 
I see pain has helped to defog the window through which I see the pain of others. Because if you twist your ankle or bump your head, or if, you're, if, you're, if you live a torment that never ebbs, what you feel and how you respond is not just the aggregate of nerve signals. It is a sum product of your entire existence. Reaching a new understanding of how we hurt will change how we live with our aching selves. And recognizing the many layers of how we respond to the agony of others could lay the foundation for a just and equitable society. So before I go any further, I wanted to build on uh, the, some of the concepts that Pawan introduced uh, and talk a little bit about what do we even talk about when we talk about pain. So most of the times, and especially more modern times, we've come to think of pain as a purely physical sensation. And yet the, the, the purely physical aspect of pain is called nociception. And the definition of nociception is essentially that it is the unconscious neural process of encoding noxious stimuli. The emphasis here is really on the unconscious part. Nociception itself doesn't actually make us feel anything. It is, it is essentially just the aggregate of nerve signals that are deemed to be noxious by our body as they reach the brain. But this is really the sort of pure sort of biological, physical component of what we call pain. And pain itself, which was just recently underwent a its definition, underwent a revision, and we just went over the de definition once more, but I think it is important enough to go over it again, is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. I mean, you can see just from this definition just how, my, how heavily hedged it is. And again, giving us a sense for that our our common understanding of pain as being inherently linked to tissue damage and inherently linked to neurological signals is not in fact what's reflected in the science. In fact, the science concedes that pain is as much a sensation as it is an emotion. And in fact, as we live with pain over a longer period of time, the very nature of how our bodies process pain changes. And this was uh, highlighted in this work uh, that was uh, performed out of Northwestern uh, that I think really uh, does a great job of uh, really showing just how uh, pain changes over time. I think one of the biggest mistakes we've made as a, as a, really as a community is that we've defined chronic pain as essentially acute pain prolonged. Yet one of the things that I've learned during this work and the research is that acute and chronic pain, the only thing that they share is the fact that they hurt. And if you look at this study in which they followed patients who had back injuries and then some went on to develop chronic pain and others didn't, what they found was that over time, initially, the, when, they looked, when they used fMRI to look at the parts of the brain that were activated in these patients, initially it was as much the aspects related to the somatosensory aspects of pain, so where's, why's, and how's of pain, as well as the emotional aspects of pain. And yet over time, it increasingly becomes more of an emotion than it becomes a sensation that's being detected in the body, almost becoming autonomous without needing that initial trigger. In fact, so many of the myths that we have about chronic pain are challenged by the science. This idea that somehow uh, the severity of the initial injury can predict chronic pain is in fact also not true. The, who goes on to develop chronic pain has almost nothing to do with how severe or the nature of their initial injury. And in fact, given time, what we start to see is that chronic pain, the, 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 the other phenomenon that chronic pain most seems to resemble in the brain is in fact the, the aspect, is how we form memories. And so how we normally form memories is that, uh, is that we basically have the development of long-term potentiation of synaptic connections in the hippocampus using this protein called PKM zeta. But, and what, what scientists did in this experiment that was published in Science was that they looked at mice who had chronic pain, and what they found was that they were seeing that there were high levels of PKM zeta activation in the areas of the brain responsible for chronic pain in mice that did go on to show behaviors suggesting that they did have chronic pain. And when they used an inhibitor that would prevent, the, uh, prevent this long-term potentiation, not only did these mice not develop new memories, they also didn't develop chronic pain. And in fact, many of the new therapies that are being developed to look at chronic pain are actually using, are being borrowed from other conditions such as PTSD. And the last aspect of pain that Paolo also mentioned is suffering. Now, you know, suffering, uh, to me, the best definition of suffering comes from Eric Cassell. Eric uh, was a primary care physician and really a pioneer in the field of palliative care. 
I had the uh, opportunity to interview him just a few of weeks actually before he passed away. But his definition in the New England Journal to me is very resonant. He said that suffering is a state of severe distress associated with events that threaten the intactness of the person. And what we see in clinical science and clinical medicine, when we see patients in the ward, when we see patients in the clinic, oftentimes what we're seeing is a combination of all of these phenomena. We have most of our patients are really right in the middle where they're experiencing nociception pain and are also suffering. Certainly you can have one of these aspects on their own. You can have nociception without feeling anything else. Think about your patient who's under anesthesia or think about the fact that the, uh, the more than 50% of soldiers who are in battlefields with gruesome injuries actually report no pain at all. You can have pain without nociception suffering. One example is perhaps phantom limb pain and certainly we have this deep well of suffering that requires no physical injury uh, as a trigger. But I find this concept to be helpful as I see my patients in clinic and I start to tease apart what in fact is really going on with my patient. It is hard to talk more about or a lot about pain without really thinking about uh, how, how it relates to the opioid epidemic. And here I'm just gonna give you a brief, epi a brief sort of overview of how we ended up in the situation we're in. Now, this isn't news to many of the people in this room, but let's just recap this story real quickly about how we came to be and how this opioid epidemic now in this third decade uh, is still going on. Now in the 90s, chronic pain was rampant in America. Opioids, which had previously been taboo, were certainly being aggressively prescribed. A supposedly safer opioid was developed, which uh, it was claimed in the New England Journal was not a hypnotic and actually carried no danger of addiction. But yet this movement addicted millions of Americans to opioids and now almost a million people have died from opioid overdoses. Now this story might feel very familiar to all of you, but the fact is that I'm actually not talking about the 1990s. I'm actually talking about the 1890s. So this idea that we have that this, this current opioid epidemic is some unique phenomenon in American history is actually not true because we've had something very similar happen just about 100 years ago. And the reason why that epidemic happened was because initially it was started by what, it, what I consider is probably one of the most important uh, discoveries in medicine. This is Friedrich Sir Turner. He was a pharmacist in Germany who developed the drug he named after the god of dreams, morphine. Uh, but what he didn't, what he lacked was no good way of getting morphine to patients. That was overcome by the development of the hypodermic needle by Alexander Wood. And the big test case for this uh, drug became this is the US Civil War, one of the most gruesome wars in the history of, uh, of mankind. Hundreds of thousands of people were ampu amputated in, in addition to millions more who died. And what started off with the treatment of pain among soldiers and veterans then spread through society to the point that one in 200 Americans became addicted to opioids. The response from the pharmaceutical industry was the development of a drug that was touted as a treatment for morphine addiction. That drug was heroin, you can imagine how that went. And at that point, the response uh, from the um, government was the establishment of an opioid czar, uh, who was a physician, uh, uh, Dr. Hamilton Wright. And he, his response was essentially to say that we're just gonna stop the prescription of opioids in this country, period. And what that led to was the fact that there were then millions and millions of Americans who were dying, who were dying of cancer or other diseases after surgery who received no pain control at all because we decided that the only way we can coexist, that the only way that we can exist as a society was to eliminate all opioids uh, and not, not even if it was for someone in extremis. So just to recap, in the 19th century, the trigger for the opioid epidemic at that point was a civil war. The innovation was the morphine, was the development of morphine and the hypodermic needle. It led to one in 200 Americans being addicted. The supposed solution was heroin and the response was criminalization of opium and the war on drugs. And what we're experiencing now is that the supposed innovation that was supposed to treat um, opioid addiction in our current era was the development of OxyContin that we know that story quite well wasn't really the case. It has led to a million fatal overdoses. And the, our response so far has been deep prescription and criminal and civil action against manufacturers. And yet we're still not having the bigger conversation about how are we going to do better for patients with chronic pain. 
Now let's just uh, see where we are at with regards to the epidemic. So these are national US prescription rates for opioids. And when I started residency, I was in 2010, 11, which was really at the peak of, the, of, when, of uh, when we were prescribing opioids at highest rate. So really that was a big part of my training was essentially using opioids or negotiating opioid use with my patients. Prescription rates have gone down over time. They still are probably higher than the, where they need to be, and they're certainly much higher than other comparative countries, but we have made progress in that regard. But where we haven't made progress is, in fact, the number of deaths from opioids. As prescription rates for opioids have gone down, the number of deaths from opioids have actually gone up quite considerably. And the, the reason these deaths are going up is not because we've had a spike in heroin use or methadone use or semi-synthetic drugs, it's all really being driven by the use of fentanyl or illicit fentanyl that is much more likely to cause a fatal overdose. And uh, the epidemic itself has changed quite a bit. Uh, you know, traditionally we used to think of this epidemic as something that only affects mostly white rural Americans. And yet what you see is that in 2019, uh, for the first time in history, more black Americans had a higher rate of deaths from opioid overdoses and white Americans, and that rate has climbed up considerably. So you can see how this problem might now start to be, uh, take the same contours as previous attempts at curtailing drug use in this country have, where we've gone towards excessive criminalization and police brutality as a way of managing these issues. And those disparities are going to get even worse. If you look at substance use disorder treatment, uh, the number of people who actually get a, uh, substance use uh, treatment for substance use disorder is only about 14%, and yet only about uh, the rate for black Americans getting those treatments is half of that. So these disparities, unfortunately, are going to get wider and wider. I think for a long period of time, we used to think that this is an issue that only affects red America, and certainly if you look by county uh, political affiliation, we have shown that, yes, uh, more deaths per capita from opioids happen in uh, Republican counties, if you look back in 2001, but rates of death from opioids have increased both in Democratic and Republican counties. So this isn't a red or blue uh, America problem. This is an issue that affects almost all of us. Even uh, as a heart uh, transplant cardiologist, our practice has been completely changed by this opioid epidemic. We almost never took donors who died of drug overdoses, and now today, opioid overdoses are the leading cause of people becoming donors for uh, for hearts, which is, uh, I guess, good for heart transplant recipients, but pretty bad for where our society is headed. So, and one of the things that really allowed this to happen was the fact that we, that medical education itself, you know, forums such as this became venues for the spread of misinformation. And so part of what I'm trying to do is that as we try and reset and really begin to look at chronic pain anew, we have to really think about what, how were we complicit? How did we allow so much misinformation about both opioids and chronic pain to spread? I'm gonna sh share a few examples here that can illustrate just how we let this happen. So perhaps the first uh, sort of myth or lie, whatever you wanna call it, um, about opioids was the fact that the opioids cause addiction in less than 1% of pain patients. This really became the hallmark, the bedrock of not just education, but also marketing of drugs. Uh, for people with chronic pain. So the question is, where do we get this from? And all of this, this, this big statement really originated from this five sentence research letter that was published in the New England Journal in the, 1980, in, in the 1980s, uh, which uh, performed this large chart review of patients uh, in, in, at Boston Medical Center to really no way of even looking for addiction or other adverse events and concluded that only about a couple of those patients had shown any evidence of addiction. If you look at what happened afterwards, this paper was cited hundreds and thousands of times in the medical literature, almost always completely affirmationally without any sort of contesting of its conclusions. And this was just the tip of the iceberg. This really became the reason how pharmaceutical companies were able to change the prescription patterns of physicians and led to the, at least the initiation of the epidemic. And today, if you go on the medical journal site, there's the paper is still there, but it comes with this disclaimer. It says that, well, for reasons of public health, readers should be aware that this letter has been heavily and uncritically cited as evidence that addiction is rare with opioid therapy. But to me, the question is, is it too little, too late? 
Another uh, sort of lie that has been perpetuated in both sort of medical education, but, but beyond that is this idea that under treating pain can lead to pseudo addiction. Uh, and this was certainly that uh, something that I was taught when I was a resident. And um, this originated from a case report, a single case report of a single 17 year old uh, boy who had leukemia. Uh, and the idea was that this, this boy was showing all the evidence or all the sort of behaviors that we associate with opioid addiction. And yet the author said that the, the, that the treatment for someone who is showing behaviors that are consistent with addiction is in fact giving them more opioids and that is really all because we're under treating their pain. And now the fact is that uh, the, 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 of these two authors, David Haddox was a senior author, later on became the chief medical officer at Purdue Pharma. Uh, so if, but if that's not enough, if you look at what happened after this paper, this, this, this uh, concept was also cited, again, hundreds of times in the medical literature and 98% of the times we agreed it as fact. We just, we just all decided that based on this one presentation that this was something that was a very prevalent part of the treatment of people uh, receiving opiates, only 2% of papers disagreed with it. But I think the more telling thing is that not a single paper attempted to validate this concept at all. Then there's this other concept of the fact that long acting opioids as opposed to short acting opioids are less addictive and are more effective for chronic pain. And the question is, well, where did this come from? Certainly this was one of the basis of the success of OxyContin. But the source of this piece of misinformation was a very curious place. This is actually from the FDA label for OxyContin itself, which said verbatim that delayed absorption as provided by OxyContin tablets is believed to reduce the abuse liability of a drug. Now, this is a pretty powerful statement and the FDA label for those who are not aware is a very, very powerful uh, document because that is sets the standard and basis for how you can advertise and market these drugs. But the fact is that there was no evidence that was presented by Purdue Pharma to actually make this statement. So, the, so when this came up in, uh, in court cases afterwards, the question was, how did the FDA allow this to happen? And in fact, Purdue officials testified that the sentence was added by the FDA on their own initiative. This wasn't even something that Purdue had actually pitched. It was something in the track changes was added by one of the reviewers. Now, the direct identity of the reviewer is unknown, but one of the one of the people that a lot of people point to potentially is Curtis Wright. This is not Curtis Wright, but this is the actor who plays Curtis Wright on the Hulu show Dope Sick. But Curtis Wright was the lead reviewer for OxyContin at the FDA, and two years after this review, had of, uh, was one of the, was a senior uh, executive at Purdue Pharma as well. But to me, this is probably the most important thing, and this is, I think, the reason why. Um, I think opioids have really proliferated as and has really become a, a sort of you know treatment of choice for people with chronic pain because it's predicated on this idea that yes they have a lot of adverse effects yes that people can addict it but at least they are effective for chronic pain and yet we know today that there is in fact no evidence to support that statement it, the AHRQ has a sort of running sort of real time review that they update all the time which shows no benefit of opioids over other painkillers including NSAIDs and, and, and ibuprofen. And the best randomized trial data that we have uh, for people with musculoskeletal uh, pain comes from this paper. This is a space trial. This is a VA trial that was published in JAMA in 2018. And this is in this trial, they enrolled patients with moderate to severe pain in their either backs or in their, or in their joints and randomized them to opioids and non opioids, such as, you know, again, doesn't sound all that much ibuprofen and NSAIDs. And what they when they first looked at pain related function at 12 months, so they saw the, how functional are patients who receive opioids versus ibuprofen NSAIDs, they found no significant difference between the two groups. But to me, the more important thing is then they looked at pain intensity and they found that people who received opioids has statistically higher pain intensity at 12 months compared to ibuprofen and NSAIDs. Now you might, uh, someone might ask, well, how can this be? I have so many patients who swear by, op by opioids. Now, the fact of the matter is opioids are probably the most effective treatment we have for acute pain, but chronic pain is a totally different beast. In fact, one of the things that chronic opioid use does is that all of our bodies, we have these endogenous opioid systems that are related not just to make sure that we stay pain-free, but they are the reason why you might feel happy, the reason why a mother might feel joy from holding her child, this is a reason why we feel a sense of social connection and chronic use of opioids not only takes away our ability to fight off aches and pains on our own, it actually takes away those aspects as well. Perhaps one of the reasons why 
when people wean off opioids, their mood and sense of well-being actually improves over time. And the last thing that I think has been perpetuated in uh, both sort of medical training and otherwise is this idea that black people have a higher threshold for pain. And the origin of this theory really comes from this physician who's pretty despicable. His name was Samuel Cartwright. He was in the South in Louisiana who developed, who essentially made up these medical conditions uh, that basically posited that, that black slaves were in, insensitive to pain, essentially using that as a justification to inflict all sorts of horrendous violence on, uh, on these people. Um, someone might ask, well, this happened 100 or so years ago. Why is this in point today? But in a very recent survey that was published uh, in PNAS in 2016, they surveyed uh, medical students and residents, and they asked them about a lot of questions. One of the questions was whether, whether, whether respondents believed that black people's skin was thicker than white people's, again, as a way of saying that they have higher threshold for pain, they found that almost a third of medical students and residents had this belief, and people who had this belief were also less likely to provide pain relief for their black patients. And, and to me, one of the biggest examples of how systemic racism affects the, the practice of pain medicine comes from this paper that was published in JAMA Pediatrics. So this was a study of a million children. So, uh, and the reason I, I think this is important is because, well, we might feel like, oh, grown-ups we might have questions about whether they are drug seeking or whether they are, they are looking for secondary gain. But this was uh, a study of a million kids presenting to emergency rooms with CT scan confirmed appendicitis. Uh, and they looked at patients uh, who had, or kids who had severe pain and found that the odds of a black child in severe pain receiving opioids for pain, for pain relief was only a fifth of that of a white child. And I think that this is really the tip of the iceberg. The fact of the matter is that if you have any sort of disadvantage in life, if you are poor, if you're from a rural area, if you're an immigrant, if you're black, that disadvantage is magnified when you are in pain. And in fact, there was a recent, tri uh, there was a recent uh, essay that was written by Nicholas Kristof uh, that was in the New York Times that looked at the sort of greater social dimensions of pain and he cited some very interesting uh, uh, data in that. And when he, when he spoke to me, we had a long interview, but I think the quote he used from me was this idea that pain is the most complex experience a human body can have. And I think it was exemplified by some of this work that he, that he cited showing that poor Americans are more than three times more likely to repair, report pain than the wealthy. High school dropouts are five times more likely than college dropouts to report severe pain. And that every 3% increase in unemployment leads a one person increase in chronic pain. But one of the reasons why I think all of us are in this room and we care about, and I certainly care a lot about chronic pain, is that in my mind, the experience of, the, of a patient with chronic pain is different from any other disease that they can have. I take care of patients uh, who have heart disease and heart failure. I've previously been an oncology hospital, so I know I've taken care of patients with cancer as well. And yet, in my mind, the experience of patients with chronic pain today is worse than almost any other disease that I've, that I've seen. And I'm going to describe some of what I wrote about from this excerpt in the book. Disease is a primal part of every human being's story, a rite of passage we all have to undergo as we slowly move between birth and death. And the way we often make sense of our diseases is through storytelling. Of course, the interplay between patients and the healthcare system is not one-sided. Medical professionals help assemble the narrative. Trained over years of school with simulated actors or through multiple choice questions predicated on who done it style clinical scenarios, clinicians come to expect a certain cadence to patients' presentations. You don't even have to be sick or caring for someone sick to recognize the classic arc of illness. Um, I have a few pictures that are missing here, but um, the vibrant person who precedes a patient is struck by a mysterious illness, often but not always manifesting as physical discomfort. The now patient often posited as a fighter charged charges forth in lockstep with their medical team in search of not just the cure, but more importantly, the reason and the meaning behind why they were dropped into this minefield to begin with. Chronic pain, however, does not conform to these rules and stereotypes. Its most deadly feature is that it disrupts the way a person moves through their life, the narrative they define themselves by, 
the arc of their lives. A healthy body feels absent and invisible. Yet the body becomes so present during sickness, creating a wedge between it and the occupant. People in pain feel like their own body is an adversary. Their bodies alienate them from their healthy absent bodied pasts and when it comes to chronic pain, they rob them of their futures as well. Chronic pain has this existential dimension. What if this never goes away? What if it tarnishes and blackens every month or every year? With a past that has become unfamiliar and a future shrouded in dread, people with chronic pain become trapped in a never ending present. And certainly as someone who had chronic pain, I saw my entire life slip right in front of my eyes. I was a medical student and before I know it, I couldn't do a single thing. I couldn't sit, I couldn't stand. Those were really central to my ability to be a person. And for a long time, I wasn't even sure if I could finish medical school. And yet our patients have to have these types of crises that not only affect them, but affect every aspect of who they are, what they can do, who they can love and where they can be. And as I went on this journey and I started writing this book, I came, um, I, I, I initially started off being quite pessimistic because I, because the state of how we are treating pain in this country and around the world was something that caused me quite distress. And yet the more research that I've done and, the, uh, and, and looking at where the science of pain is now going, I feel I'm more hopeful today than I've ever been before. And part of what, part of what we have to do, I think, to keep going forward and to overcome this crisis is, this, is, is changing how we think about the mind and the body and to really realize that they're both one and the same. You know, this, this, this sentence all in the head has been used as a way of minimizing and delegitimizing how people feel, but I feel like that is something that we have to actually use and recruit as a way of strengthening and enabling people to know that the mind is in fact central to how we experience pain, but it can also be used as a way to overcome it. And I think the best example, or at least one of the examples of showing just how powerful the mind is in, uh, and how, how strong we have internal mechanisms to overcome pain is by looking at the placebo effect. So this is a meta-analysis that was published in the BMJ that shows and the blue bars are the contextual effects or the sort of placebo effects that we call, and the yellow bars are the specific effects of the drug itself. And we can see that in patients with chronic pain from osteoarthritis, they're getting a large part of the benefit that they're experiencing in clinical care is actually coming from the so-called placebo effect. And the fact of the matter is that the placebo effect is not static, it's actually changing as our culture and our society changes. And this was a meta-analysis of patients with neuropathic pain, which I find extremely fascinating. And what they did was they looked at, they looked at the placebo control arms for all these different trials that have been done in patients who had had neuropathic pain. And what they found was that not only is the placebo response quite significant, but that at least in the United States, in the US, patients have a higher placebo response than any other country in the entire world, and that that placebo response is actually increasing over time. Um, and you might think, or you might ask, well, why is that the case? Well, I have a few theories. Well, one is that we're one of the only high-income countries that allow drugs to be directly marketed to patients, and so again, suggests the success of billions and billions of dollars of marketing, but it also reflects something that is now deeply embedded in our society where we have, where we look to drugs and procedures as a way of overcoming not just how we feel, but really how, uh, but, but every somatic and psychosomatic emotion that we have as well. And so this is a problem, especially for new innovations, for new drugs or, or procedures, because simply beating the placebo arm in the American population is becoming increasingly difficult. But the question is, well, this, this all sounds great, but we can't really use placebo in our, in our regular practice. That would be deception. But the fact of the matter is that there have been many, many, many studies, most of them in patients with chronic pain that have actually provided what's called open label placebo. And in open label placebo, you'll get a drug and there'll be a big label on the drug that will say placebo. But the physician will explain that, or the clinician, whoever is administering it will explain that there has been prior data that has shown that placebo can actually be quite effective in someone like you. And in, in this, in this meta-analysis of, of, of randomized trials that have used open-label placebo, even then you actually see that there is a very significant benefit. So well then the question is, well, what is mediating the placebo response? And uh, this was really nicely uh, highlighted by this trial that was done by Ted Kaptick, who is a researcher in, uh, in Boston. 
And he looked at patients who had irritable bowel syndrome. And he had three arms in this trial. He had a, he had a uh, so this was a trial of acupuncture. So he had one patient, one arm was getting acupuncture. They would go, they would get acupuncture. But the acupuncture was not being performed, was, was simply, it was just a procedure. that They would go in, the person wouldn't actually say anything to them. They would just do the procedure, and then they would let them go. The second arm was what, uh, what he called the augmented placebo. And in this, the person, the practitioner was actually trained in practices of empathy. So they would ask, how are you doing? How does this make you feel? Are you feeling better? So they would, they would practice all of what we consider to be good doctoring, being a good human being in the presence of a patient. And the third was a wait list. And what he found was that patients who received this augmented placebo did better in almost every aspect uh, or every outcome that they looked at, including pain relief, quality of life, symptom severity, et cetera. Again, showing that it is us. It is this experience that we, that we provide patients, this care, nurture, uh, care that they feel, this protection that they feel from being seen by a physician that is really our superpower. So even with someone who has intractable pain and we have no, uh, no actual treatments for, I think just the presence, uh, just our presence as, as, as someone who provides them an ear as Pavan does in his clinic, I think can provide a really meaningful difference. Um, and I think this is an area that we in medicine and especially in pain medicine, we really need to think about. One of the things that I found very surprising is that of all anesthesia subspecialties, women are least likely to be pain physicians. Of all the pain, of all the subspecialties in medicine, uh, the greatest ge uh, gender disparity exists in pain medicine, even though we know that, uh, that women in general in studies have shown to be more empathetic and that the vast majority of patients with chronic pain are also women. So this is also an issue where I think you can see how not having, not having a diverse workforce is actually having actual consequences for patients. But as I said, I mean, there's so much exciting work that's going on uh, that, that makes me very hopeful. And I guess this is, this, is, this is one of those studies that I think has really changed my practice and my way of thinking about these patients. So this was a trial, a randomized trial of patients who had chronic back pain. Um, and they, uh, this is a form of cognitive therapy that the researchers call pain reprocessing therapy. And really what pain reprocessing therapy is, it, it basically teaches patients that the brain actively constructs primary chronic pain in the absence of tissue damage and that reappraising the causes and threat value of pain can reduce or eliminate it. So essentially what the researchers are doing is that they're taking the fear that patients have from their pain away from it. They're, they're saying that just because, you know, our pain is the loudest signal that can go off in your body. And our response is the same, whether we've had pain for months or whether we've had pain the first time. And the idea is that in patients with chronic pain, we try and dissociate that type of response. And, and, and so what, what in this trial that they did is after they enrolled patients, patients received uh, this form of therapy for a month, and then they followed them for a year. And what they found here is so if you look at panel A, PRT is the blue line, and what they found is that pain intensity is much lower in patients who received not just uh, usual care, but also placebo. Again, they controlled for the placebo response here, and that they had a durable effect for more than a year. In fact, if you look at the number of patients who were able to remain pain-free, this is, uh, this is uh, in, in C, you'll see that more than 50% of patients at one year who received just this month of pain reprocessing therapy were pain-free compared to at 15% of patients who were receiving usual care. And when I looked at this data, it gave me a lot of hope because I think for so much time, I think in medicine, we have directed patients who are in pain towards either drugs or procedures. And yet what this shows is that really, we have this, uh, th this deep well of our of ability to heal ourselves, even when we are in intractable pain. And what I have tried to do since then is I've tried to incorporate aspects of this form of thinking into how I communicate with my patient when they come in pain. And I'm going to share a section in which I describe one such encounter. Of the many peculiarities in the practice of medicine, one that is particularly peculiar is that doctors and nurses are highly unlikely to have lived this serious illness. They're like chefs who have never tasted their own food. That changed recently when my patient and I both got the same viral infection, shingles. As my rash faded, my patient's trial was only beginning. Innumerable medicines and nerve blocks to quell the torment had failed to give him back a shred of his previous pain-free existence. 
Robbed of his dreams, he was so depressed, he had essentially stopped eating. He showed me a picture of himself playing golf before shingles had crashed into him, and he looked unrecognizable. His agony was so consumptive, so ravenous, it had left him emaciated. We had already exhausted every conceivable medical intervention. We didn't even know where his affliction really lay. Was the furnace in his nerves causing his catatonic depression, or was his depression keeping the flames in his nerves alight? Yet we were, at, we were struggling to define something even more basic. Was he in pain or was he suffering? In my native language, Urdu, the word for journey, suffer, is a homonym of the English word for suffer. And it has always seemed particularly beyond coincidence. I sat on the bed next to him. Though I was skeptical we would find some new cause for his pain or uncover a treatment that would rid him of his agony. I reassured him that we as a team were fully committed to figuring out why he hurt so much and what we could do to help. At the same time, though, I confessed that the likelihood that we could make the pain go away was low. I want to help you live with this pain, I told him. I want you back to playing golf again. Perhaps because he believed that we were all in and committed, that we would do whatever it might take to help him, his entire outlook changed. He refused to go to a rehab facility, motivated to get stronger on his own. Before he left, I asked if he was interested in seeing a pain psychologist. We were not raising the white flag, I told him, but gathering all the options we had at our disposal to close the rift that had opened up in his body. He eagerly accepted the referral. The most cutting edge pain science is not just revealing new things about pain, but reintroducing a way to inhabit our body at odds with a burgeoning corporate machine selling visions of immortality and mass anesthesia. The most important thing doctors and nurses and physical therapists can do is to center their practice in empathy and kindness, but to allow kind kindness to become the standard of care, our medical schools and training programs have to make it a point of emphasis and our health system has to evolve. We need to take a multidisciplinary approach to pain that provides patients with all the tools we have to diminish how much they hurt. We need to make person-centered care a reality rather than a buzzword by shifting the way providers are paid to reflect how patients do rather than what we do to them. The reward for designing a healthcare system that provides care and love to all might resonate beyond the walls of hospitals and clinics. It will be the keystone for more just and equitable society. Instead of using all in the head to belittle, we should use it to empower. Instead of having people look to external sources for respite, medicine needs to help people maximize their own inner ability to achieve harmony. Instead of waging a war on pain, trying to conquer it at all costs, we must rediscover a new way forward. That way will be to reconnect with a way of being that is innately our own, a system of a state of actuality that connects us to our past, anchors us in the present, and provides hope for the future, living well despite the pain. Thank you.